March 20, 2010. It had been several years since I grew up and began my life as a sophomore in high school, when a dark shadow had fallen over our town. It started a few weeks ago when the first news report flashed across the TV screen. A father murdered in cold blood, his young son left orphaned. In the week since, two more families were torn apart by senseless violence. The mo was always the same, a playing card left behind at each crime scene, a calling card from a deranged killer. As the body count rose, a dread descended upon our community, worrying this killer could come to our town. Parents held their children a little tighter, doors were locked and curtains drawn. Anxious glances were exchanged at the supermarket and post office as people wondered who, when the killer could strike our town. My mother's face paled at the news, and my father's expression grew grim as he muttered under his breath about the pure evil that could do such a thing. As I watched the news report with growing unease, the camera footage of a family flashed across the screen, with the reporter detailing the harrowing details of the crime, the sense of horror and dread that permeated the room, and I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. The thought that such heinous acts could be committed so close to home sent a shiver down my spine. As we sat there in front of the television, watching the news report detailing the gruesome murder of a father and the devastating effect it would have on his family, my parents and I were all deeply distraught. The thought of someone committing such a horrible crime against a parent and leaving an innocent child without a father was unfathomable. Our sense of shock and horror was compounded by the fact that these events were unfolding in close proximity to our own community. The idea that such a vicious killer could be lurking in our midst filled us with a sense of dread and foreboding. We couldn't help but wonder if our own town would be next, or if another innocent family would be the next victim. While my heart went out to the grieving mother and son, I couldn't shake off the strange feeling that was creeping up inside me. It was an inexplicable sensation, like a knot in my stomach, a sense of unease that I couldn't quite put my finger on. I knew that something was happening to me, but I couldn't describe it, and the uncertainty of it all only added to my anxiety. As the news report ended, a chill crept over me that had nothing to do with the air conditioning. An icy claw gripped my stomach as the full impact of the murders sunk in. A serial killer was roaming free in a town just like ours, shattering families and leaving only terror in his wake. I tried to shake off the sense of dread swelling inside me, but it persisted, tangling my thoughts like vines. Was it just run? Of, uh, mill anxiety? Or a premonition that worse things were coming? I didn't know. All I knew was that the unease was quickly metastasizing into full-blown panic. I grabbed my phone with a shaky hand and called the one person who could always soothe my worries, my girlfriend, Octavia. Her voice, normally bubbly and bright, was subdued. Clearly the news had shaken her too. She was genuinely affected by the news, and it hurt her to think about the families that had been torn apart by such senseless violence. It was one of the things I loved most about her, her big heart and love for others. Hey, she answered her normally cheerful voice subdued. Did you see the news? I asked. She sighed. Yeah, it's awful. I can't stop thinking about it, I admitted. Those poor families. And the killer is still out there somewhere. My voice trailed off as a fresh wave of dread washed over me. Octavia was quiet for a moment. I'm scared too, she finally said. Every time I close my eyes, I see those crime scenes. Me too, I confessed. I feel like he could show up any moment, like there's no escaping him. Let's try not to panic yet, Octavia said gently. The police will catch him. We just need to be cautious until they do. I rubbed my temples, trying to ease the tension headache brewing there. You're right. Being paranoid won't help, but I can't shake this feeling that something terrible is coming. I know, she soothed, but whatever happens, we'll face it together. We'll get through this, okay? Her words were meant to reassure me, but they provided little comfort. Still, I murmured my agreement, not wanting to burden her further. 
We sat in silence for a moment, thousands of unspoken fears hovering between us. But as the weeks passed, keeping my promise to stay safe grew harder and harder. More news reports came in about the serial killer. He had taken another life. The murders were getting closer to our town. The killer moved like a force of nature, ripping through community after community, leaving nothing but grief and despair in his wake. Since that first newscast, anxiety has churned inside me. With each new victim, it intensified. I tried to stay calm, but the creeping dread was inescapable. How could anyone stop a monster like this? The killer's rampage took its toll. I couldn't focus on anything else. The fear consumed me. The constant fear wore me down. I felt numb, lifeless. Getting through each day was a struggle. Even going to school felt pointless. How could I care about algebra or history? Not with a killer on the loose. Despite my constant dread, Octavia remained a ray of light. She was always finding little ways to lift my spirits. A funny meme, a homemade cupcake, a silly face to make me laugh. One afternoon she suggested we spend time together at my place. It'll be nice to just relax and try to forget all this darkness for a while she said gently. I agreed a distraction would do me good. When Octavia asked her dad Lewis if he could join, he initially declined, claiming he was too busy. But seeing his daughter's crestfallen face, he relented. I suppose I could stay for a bit. Ellie can drive you home later. Octavia's eyes lit up. She threw her arms around her father in a grateful hug. Lewis just chuckled and ruffled her hair affectionately. Side by side, they walked up the path to my front door. When I opened the door, the sight of Octavia made my heart lift. Her lustrous black hair tumbled down her shoulders, and her sky-blue eyes danced with warmth. She wore a red dress that complemented her graceful frame, along with casual jeans that highlighted her energetic spirit. Everything about her radiated life and joy, a stark contrast to my own weariness. The pop of color from her vibrant outfit lit up the doorway, and I couldn't help but smile, reminded of the light she always brought to my life. Even in the midst of such darkness, Octavia was a vision of hope. Next to Octavia's graceful beauty, Lewis cut a stoic figure in his long brown trench coat. He had a strong yet calm presence about him, exuding both wisdom and wariness, his sleek black hair and trimmed mustache gave him an air of experience, but their bond was evident in Lewis's crinkled smile and protective hand on his daughter's shoulder. Octavia's uniqueness and flair were what first drew me to her, and now, seeing her here bathed in sunlight, I was reminded how lucky I was. No matter the darkness, she was a ray of light I would always follow. As we stepped inside, Dad strode up and warmly shook Lewis's hand. Good to see you again, he said, his smile not quite reaching his eyes. Ellie chimed in with a cheerful hello, though her voice held a tense note. Octavia gave her a quick hug, but glanced anxiously between our dads. Lewis's smile faded as he turned to my father. David, can we talk outside for a minute? Dad looked at him curiously, but he nodded. Of course. They headed out to the back porch, while an uneasy silence descended on the three of us left inside. I caught Mom's eye, but she just gave a small, helpless shrug. Outside, Dad grabbed two beers from the cooler and passed one to Louis. But when he took a small sip of his own, Louis drained nearly half the bottle in one go. Dad raised an eyebrow. Rough day. Louis exhaled heavily. Rough month. David, I'm considering coming out of retirement. To find this killer. Dad froze with his bottle halfway to his lips. What are you saying? He asked carefully. I want to gather the old team. You, me, Malcolm, Trayvon. We were damn good detectives. Maybe the only ones who can stop this bastard. Lewis's eyes burned with conviction. Dad turned away. Tension etched in the set of his shoulders. Lewis, we're not as young as we used to be. And I have a family now. So do I, 
Lewis erupted. That's exactly why I have to do this, to keep Octavia and the people I care about safe. His fists clenched at his sides. Dad placed his beer down on the table with a heavy thud, his shoulders slumped in resignation. I'll consider it, he said finally, raising his eyes to meet Lewis's intense gaze. To be honest, the thought of this killer roaming free makes me sick. If there's any way to stop him to serve justice, I have to try. Lewis's face flooded with relief and gratitude. He gripped Dad's shoulder firmly. Thank you, my friend. I knew you would understand. You always had the true heart of a detective. Dad gave a sad smile. I just want to protect the people I care about, same as you. He retrieved two more bottles from the cooler and passed one to Lewis. As they clinked the frosted glass together, the sound seemed to echo across the shadowed yard. For a moment, neither man spoke, both lost in thought as they stared up at the darkening sky. Dad's jaw was tight, his eyes haunted by memories of the past and uncertainty of what was to come. In the gathering twilight, two old partners found renewed purpose. Though the road ahead was perilous, they would walk it together, as they always had, two seekers of justice driven by the undying hope that light could still conquer darkness. The bottles emptied, but still they kept vigil as the first stars emerged. Each man drew strength from the other as they prepared to face evil lurking in the depths once more.